welcome to our last uh, time through 1 Samuel 24. We left yesterday with the uh, dual ideas of God being the author of vengeance because he is best in a place to actually enact that vengeance with both justice and truthfulness, whilst we, because of our emotions and pain and sinfulness, uh, tend to merge vengeance with our own personal desires and it doesn't always result in justice. And the result we have here is that David, who knows God is the perfect enactor of vengeance, does what God's character implores him to do. He speaks the truth in love, and he speaks the truth even with reality about Saul's own evil character. Would have been a hard conversation for both David to say, and potentially for Saul to hear. Today we have what Saul not merely heard, but how he replied. Now when we tend to have a person in front of us who we speak the truth and love, and it may be hard words, what is the reaction we want? Well, let us see if you think Saul's reaction is the reaction David would have wanted. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. After hearing that response from Saul to David, I think most of us would have been quite happy to hear that as a response from Saul. He seems to be contrite in his sadness and his repentance about his hurtfulness towards David and maybe even his future orientation to kill David. And he replies in a way that seems quite appropriate. It's like he's heard the word. But over time, we get to discover another truth. Hearing is not always listening with long-term consequences. It can be quite easy to make changes to life based upon the truth you hear in the short term. And Saul, sadly, is much like that. He's a surface-level person, a superficial type of person. It was still right for David to speak the truth because now it becomes upon Saul about how he's going to respond. And he seems to respond with all the right words. But as the popular saying goes, words are cheap. Actions are where it counts. And that's why I think at the end of our text today, we don't have David applying the actions of Saul in a way that demonstrated that he believed Saul. Now, he may have believed Saul, but he wanted to see Saul live it out. In other words, once David heard Saul's reply, he didn't come back into the court. He wanted to see Saul's behavior. But more of that in a couple of days' time. Here we have the words, David, my son, he's saying the right words. You are more righteous than I. So he understands that David was making a discussion point about wickedness and that he was being evil towards David. And he sees that. He says, I know you have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. He's understanding of himself, it seems. He's let his jealousy get the better of himself. You have told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered you into my hands, but you did not kill me. So he sees the work of God in himself now being still alive because David obeyed God. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? <laughs> in other words, if I was in your situation, based on my understanding of uh, who you are, I would have killed you at the drop of a hat. In other words, David would have been dead if Saul was in the same situation. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. So he knows the prophecy, he knows the words, and he's been trying to thwart it. But as he sees God work his plans through David, he realizes that he's on the other side of that. And so he asks through an oath for David to make a covenant promise not to harm the family. As you see, now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. And David would never have wanted that to occur. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home. 
And here's the interesting ending. But David and his men went up to the stronghold. In other words, he may have wanted to, to believe Saul's words, but he needs to see the words play out in action because he has heard it all before from Saul. That Saul, after grieving his bad behavior, says he'll never do it again. And then he does. Behavior demonstrates the veracity of the words that you've just spoken. And because Saul has demonstrated an inability to display behavior, even by what he's said, David needs to see it. The proof will be in the pudding. The demonstration of behavior will be the veracity of the words, as we've just said. And that is a good lesson for us all. It is good to believe people and to give people a chance and then to embark on a situation to enable them to prove it. And it's once they've demonstrated the reality of the words that they've spoken that we can see that they've really had a change of heart. They've understood the depth of problems that they may have been a part of. For Saul, what we see here, I think, is the difference between guilt and repentance. He, in part, would have been embarrassed in front of probably his whole contingent of army, they're behind him. They're hearing this. For them, for him now to say charge and kill David would have seemed treasonous. But in a personal sense, I suspect it does reflect the guilt he is feeling and the honest guilt that he's feeling. But it doesn't go to repentance. It is much like Judas in the New Testament compared to Peter. Similar behaviours in terms of their rejection of Jesus and their inability to uphold the truthfulness that they know when it came to the shove. What did they do? They gave in to temptation. But what did they do when that temptation was put back at them by Jesus? Well, Peter repented. Judas, in guilt, did not bring that before God. And I think really this is what we have here in Saul. Saul, in guilt, does what many humans do. Says, I won't do it again. But unless you bring it before God in repentance, you're relying upon the same strength that led you down the wrong path to get you out of it. And for God, that will never be the same as repentance. Repentance is where it's at. Repentance is not merely being guilty that you got caught doing the wrong thing. It is a sorrow about the hurt that you've caused, first of all, to God by rejecting him, and then the outworking of that. And you repent of that. And repentance means to turn and go a new direction. I think if David had seen Saul go that new direction, that he would have rejoiced because he knows that God will bring his promises to fulfillment in due course for him to become king. But Saul was unable to repent at this time. He was just feeling guilty. And when the guilt waned, we'll see later his behaviour returned. Amen.